Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here because Chetra is the Australian equivalent of the Leah Roback Center. So Chetra is the Center for Health Equity Training, Research and Evaluation. Um, and we see Leah Roback as, um, as our counterpart. Um, so it's good to, uh, to be uh, in the family. Um, and yes, today I'm going to talk about synthesizing more reality or realizing more synthesis. Um, and yeah, that's a funny title, uh, but um, it's, it's about methodology for healthy cities research. And I, I, I just want to make one thing clear, um, what I mean when I say methodology. For me, methodology is the logic of method. It is how you choose methods to do research. So it, it, is, it is the philosophy that you apply to your research and how you're collecting data, how you look at the world. Um, a lot of people use methodology um, on par with method, uh, and I think it, 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 it always matters to use the right words. So methodology for me is the logic of methods. Um, I've been working uh, since the inception in 1986 uh, with the World Health Organization around healthy cities, uh, especially in Europe, but uh, very soon I got invited to Canada as well. So I remember my first time here in Canada was in, um, uh, well, for the Ottawa Conference in 1986. But then in 1988, I was invited by our friend and colleague Michel O'Neill from Laval, uh, who was instrumental in, uh, in healthy cities here in Canada. Um, so, you know, for a long, long time, I've been part of the international healthy cities movement and family, because when you meet those people, um, they become friends and you, you, you really start to appreciate what motivates people to do this work. It is not just a professional activity, it's something that you feel deeply about, uh, which influences the way we do our research, obviously. Um, over time, we, we, we have developed uh, a lot of material, facts, um, but also insights, technologies to, uh, to, to, to do healthy cities and we've documented the evidence. I, I brought our latest book, um, so maybe you could pass that around if you wouldn't want to finger it. Um, go ahead. Um, and I should say that uh, this was published earlier this year but already we found that it is lacking. Um, it's over 500 pages but it's lacking. Um, and we, we just signed a contract with Oxford University Press to go beyond just a fat book like this, and we're now in the process of developing the Healthy Cities and Communities Encyclopedia. Um, and I do that, and it's a great privilege to do that with the fathers of Healthy Cities, Trevor Hancock, who you all know, uh, a good Canadian, and John Ashton, uh, one of the first public health officers in Britain who um, started to do Healthy Cities there again. So it's, it's fantastic to be um, uh, engaged in a project like that. Um, all of these things are available online, so you don't have to carry around uh, all these heavy volumes. And um, we, we have described what I'm telling you today uh, in those books, so you can, you can read about this. Um, healthy cities research. I need to explain to you not what healthy cities are, because I assume that you have sort of a gut feeling what it is and where it comes from. But I do have to explain the context in Europe. Uh, the European Healthy Cities Movement is uh, highly codified by the World Health Organization. World Health Organization European Regional Office, um, very early on in this process, said, ooh, we need to organize those healthy cities. We need to make sure that this experiment that we're running um, gets the most value out of it. Um, so they started the process of designating healthy cities. They said, if you want to be a healthy city and you want to have the support from the World Health Organization, you need to meet a number of objectives. Um, and those objectives are, for instance, political commitment. So you can only become a, a designated European healthy city if there is a council decision, if the political body of the city says, we want to be a healthy city, we commit to its values, and we dedicate resources to doing that. Now, 
that of course, that requirement, and there's a bunch of other requirements, but that requirement in itself means that you are already doing a very good thing because then you are politically committed, you are accountable. When the council does that, the communities in that city can look at that decision and say, hey, you signed up for this, are you delivering? Uh, whereas elsewhere in the world, a lot of towns, local governments, uh, they say that they're healthy cities, but they're not transparently accountable. You know, they, they say, oh, yeah, we're a healthy city. There's, for instance, in our book, we describe an example from the Congo, Pointe Noire, which is a, a, a very large port city in, in the Republic of the Congo. They've declared themselves a healthy city. Yeah, good. For what purpose? Why? How? Are they, are they accountable? Uh, do the people even know that they're a healthy city? Which just shows how diverse those tens of thousands of healthy cities around the world are. So I'm just looking about Europe. And even within Europe, we have very high diversity already. So this, these were the cities that we were looking at in phase five of the healthy cities program in Europe. So they have different phases and each phase is about five years. And in each phase they have different priorities. Not different designation criteria, so it's not what, what differs between phases how you're designated, but <coughs> the priorities of each of those phases are different. So for instance in phase four, one of the priorities was smoke-free cities, so cities committed to being smoke-free. Whereas in phase five, this one, one of their many commitments, others were like a healthy built environment, equity and governance and things like that. One of the commitments was age-friendly cities. So the priority was how are we going in the area of age-friendliness of the urban environment. Um, there were 99 cities who signed up in the end in this phase five. Um, and one of the requirements for these cities is that they build a national network of healthy cities. So if you look, for instance, at France, um, there are four cities in France that have signed up to be an officially designated WHO healthy city, but they also commit to supporting other cities in France to also be healthy cities. So they, the other cities are not connected to the World Health Organization directly, but they are through a network that those four cities in France built up. And each of those cities on this map commit to building a national network of healthy cities. So there's 99 healthy cities and they establish networks of healthy cities. And if those networks meet, meet certain requirements, they do capacity building, for instance, they have internal training courses, they they do a continuing education, they do evaluations. If you meet the number of requirements, you can become an accredited healthy city network in, in Europe. And you can see that not all of these networks are accredited. Some of them say, we are so unique, we're so different, different we don't need to be accredited. Why would we want to be accredited? Um, but others really think that it's important to be accredited by the World Health Organization as a kind of a quality mark. Um, so there's 99 healthy cities, we are currently in phase six um, and, and new healthy cities come in continuously. Um, but these 99 healthy cities um, are connected to all these networks and if you look at how many Europeans are covered by healthy cities networks and the healthy cities values, we're talking about 450 million Europeans that are in some way or other connected to the healthy cities values and ideas. So that is uh, pretty impressive, we think. And because it's so strictly codified, we can be fairly certain that whatever happens will in fact have some kind of influence on local policy making. So healthy cities, um, <coughs> What it aims for as a European WHO program is uh, strategic long-term developments um, and, and engage in, this is never an afterthought, but always part of, of the phase, an evaluation program that recognizes the dynamics in healthy cities. 
uh, that says, look, you are all different and you evolve over time. Things continue to be different. Um, that's, uh, that, that then meant that we, we need to do dynamic research. You can't do stable, stale, traditional research. Um, you, you have to be dynamic. The research team had to be dynamic. And the tools that we apply needed to be dynamic. And that's why we needed to have a logic of method, methodology, uh, that allowed for dynamism. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, the findings of, um, of our evaluation. You can read in the book and in, 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 uh, in the journal articles that we published. Um, but uh, if you have questions about uh, the outcomes, we, we might want to discuss that after my chat today. So, um, a little bit about what healthy cities are, what those designation criteria uh, encompass. We, 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 we like this flowery um, symbol thing. Um, these are the things that healthy cities commit to. This is what they, what they do. So there's political commitment, uh, you commit to attending meetings, but you also commit to mayors of cities talking to other mayors. We require that because in the third phase we found that mayors talking to each other actually makes a difference. If we require mayors to sit together and we, we celebrate them sitting together, they exchange political views, uh, which often we don't fully control. Um, so in, in, in sharing their political finesse, um, we enable new ways of doing healthy cities. Uh, they, they are supposed to do capacity building, they are all about partnerships, um, they have to have integrated planning for health, so it's, it's not just the health care system. And often we see that uh, in cities where the health care system is not running healthy cities, we see true innovation for health. Um, as soon as you take the health care sector out of the equation, things become exciting. Um, they do that on the basis of good information, not just good epidemiological information, but also social uh, uh, network mapping uh, information. You need to have a coordinator, you need to have an intersectoral steering group. Um, there needs to be sustained local support, so it needs to be grounded in community action. We need to see that cities actually work with communities, which for us here in Canada or in Australia is a given for everything we do. Um, but that's not always what cities in Eastern Europe used to do, for instance. Uh, they, they, they thought that you know, top-down governance, government telling people what to do, uh, is, is the only way to do things. So that often is a bit of an uh, innovative way of, uh, of looking at things. And then, as I said, we always monitor and evaluate uh, healthy city. So there's, there's, there's a system of continuous data collection and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, to start with how dynamic and complex our evaluation is, you would think that each of those phases starts with all of those cities. You know, in traditional research, epidemiolo epidemiolo epidemiological research, you start off with your entire experimental group and you look at them throughout the life of whatever you're doing in an intervention. Problem with healthy cities is that um, they are not a stable group. So if you look at this uh, uh, graph uh, at the entry points of the different cities in the network, you see that uh, uh, 13 cities were designated the, f the fourth quarter of 2008 and then slowly the rest trickled in. So we couldn't control for a certain starting point. We couldn't say at T, T1 or T0, this is what, where we started, and then we had a T1, T2. You couldn't really compare because there were two cities that, that joined the network out of those 99 at the very last moment of the phase. So how do you account for that? Um, some of these cities... Uh, were designated in the middle of the phase, but they already were designated in a previous phase. And because of shit going on in their cities, elections, or people saying we don't want to waste any more money on this healthy city stuff, um, they were slow in, in renewing their membership. Um, 
And as long as they were not a member, we didn't collect any data. So, hey, what, what do you do then? So there are, in a traditional way, you would say there are gaps in the data. We said, well, we just need to account for the differences. So cities move in all the time. Um, also, healthy cities, as you will have understood now in the European context, is not a straightforward single intervention. It is not that you say, we're going to do healthy built environments. Here's the guide. These are the 10 things that you have to do in order to make streets safe, walkable, accessible. It's a lot more. So the lot more is, is this. So there are a number of prerequisites, the designation criteria. So we, we need leadership. We need politicians to be on board, but also leadership from a steering group from the community. They need vision and strategy. Yes, there is a commitment to the values of healthy cities, but that means that locally you need to have your own vision and strategy because each city is different. Milan is different from Stockholm, obviously. They're very small cities, they're very large cities. So for your own city, you need to have your own vision and your own leadership. It is about networks. Healthy cities are not... Uh, uh, a single sector enterprise. It's not that healthcare or the police or the education sector or social work runs the business. It's about networking our efforts. And you need to have a number of structures and processes in place. So you need to have an intersectoral steering group, you need to have this, you need to have that. So we, we are sure that those commitments are in place, but for each city they will be different. From those prerequisites, we have activities and in one of the things that WHO and the people that are behind WHO stimulating this say is that we don't want projects. Projects, um, you, you may have heard the term projectitis or projectism, it's a terrible disease <laughs> that afflicts the best of organizations. Projectitis is that you do something for six months and then you end it and you don't learn from it. In the WHO perspective, projects are learning steps towards programs. So you, program is a series of projects that build on each other. Programs then lead to policies, insight in how we should structure the world, how we will allocate our resources for the longer run. And out of policies come new projects to implement those policies and new programs and new policies. Um, and we have labeled those activities. Um, those activities aim at uh, four big areas of impact or, or the status of the city. Um, caring and supportive environments and there are about 20 different priorities within caring and supportive environments. Communities caring for each other, age-friendly cities for instance. Um, the hardware, healthy urban environment and design, but obviously people committing to uh, a better life are engaged in uh, healthy, healthy design and healthy infrastructures. Those areas facilitate better opportunities for healthy living and better opportunities for healthy living, making healthy choices the easier choices, leads to more health, but more importantly to more health equity. We don't want to lift everybody up and retain the inequities that may exist. We want to lift those at the lower end up more than those at the higher end. Um, and health equity is um, a tough concept. It's, 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 it's problematic. Uh, a lot of governments recognize now that there are inequities in health but they don't know what to do about them. Because if you listen to Michael Marmot, for instance, who says, oh, epidemiologically we see health inequity is terrible, and Michael then says, what we need is proportionate universalism. Well, tell that to a mayor of a city, and the mayor will go, hello, what does that mean? Um, so Healthy Cities has enabled local politicians, local councils, local communities to understand what it is to close that gap, which is 
to invest more of the same, but also more of different things in communities and people um, that are lagging behind, uh, which is an incredibly difficult uh, issue. And, and the people who work here at uh, the Lea Roback Center will know all of that. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very tough nut to crack, the health inequity nut. <coughs> So that's the complexity of we want to, what we want to uh, accomplish in, in healthy cities. Uh, what this means is that you need to collect data on all of those things. You need to have information on all of those things. Are the prerequisites throughout the life of a healthy city, are they in place? That political commitment, yes, we require it, but will it stay alive? Will it stay strong? Um, those po that idea that projects lead to programs, lead to policies, and then you start to cycle again. Is that happening? And, and what does that mean for the priorities that cities have in uh, creating caring and supportive environments and communities, doing healthy uh, 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 urban environment and design, etc., etc. So there's lots of things that you need to monitor, that you need to measure along the way. So we had a, a lot of um, um, data collection mechanisms in place already because this was not the first time that we did our evaluation. Um, there are things that are called ART, the annual reporting template. So against the designation criteria, we ask cities to report how they're doing on those criteria that they originally signed up for. There is, at the end of each phase, there is something called a general evaluation questionnaire, which uh, in its original form was 250 questions. And when we piloted that, it's always important to pilot your research tools. Never assume that because you're a clever academic, your tool is the right one. Um, so when we piloted our general evaluation questionnaire, we found that healthy city coordinators needed two weeks to fill them out. And these are busy people. So two weeks filling this out is ridiculous. So we needed to make sure that we told them how to engage in this process. We needed to make it shorter, but we also needed to make sure that it wasn't their sole responsibility to fill out that questionnaire. They needed to share it because, as I said, Healthy Cities is a networking thing. So they could send parts of the questionnaire to others and asked others to fill out what, uh, what was required. Then what, what we ideally wanted to do was to interview people, to interview all stakeholders that contributed to, to this process in all 99 cities. Now, we didn't have budget for that. Can you imagine what, what that would require? That would require millions of dollars just traveling around, sitting down hotels. Uh, um, so we we had to be creative. How do you deal with what we wanted to do in an ideal world, but what we couldn't do in the practical world? So we thought, we asked these cities to write case studies. And we trained them developing those case studies. We have annual business meetings where the healthy cities come. And we, we, we again, uh, thought up the idea that you have thematic case studies, strategic case studies, and proudest achievement case studies. So the thematic ones are talking about caring and supportive environments, healthy urban environment and design, healthy living, health and health equity. So what can you tell us you're doing? Why are you doing it? Where does it come from? How have you progressed in this? So there were 10 questions that we wanted people to address in their case study in thematic areas. But we also wanted to have strategic case studies where we asked the leadership, the networking, how does that contribute to what you accomplish in the coalface activities? So if you recognize re leadership is required to do healthy cities, how does that work? Tell us how in your city you maintain leadership. Um, and proudest achievement, cities do a lot of things. Um, that you can't just capture in um, uh, themes or in strategies. So we should allow them to tell them, to tell us their their stories. What is it that you find cool about your own city? Um, 
then we, 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 we recognize that a lot of data are already available. You just need to mine those data. There, and, and in, in Europe, there is uh, an organization called Eurostat, and Eurostat collects data at low, very low, high-resolution geographic uh, uh, areas. Uh, so you can actually collect quantitative data on particular cities already. Cities, strangely, often themselves don't know that. They don't know that someone else is already collecting data about those cities. Uh, often cities don't have their own statistics department. So in, 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 in previous research, we asked cities, give us the data on this and this and this, access to green space. And city would know, we don't collect that data. We discovered that Eurostat actually does collect that data and that it's validated and that it's the same for 35 European countries, not just countries of the European Union, but uh, also, for instance, Israel. Uh, so Eurostat is there and then there is a process of healthy city indicators that, uh, that cities are engaged in. Um, and there is a lot of paperwork. There's, there's mountains and mountains and mountains of paper that, that is available on cities. Uh, reports that people do, um, all that sort of stuff. So we have those data. Um, how do you make sense of all of that? Especially when everything is so dynamic and every city is different and still you want to say something about each particular city but also the healthy cities idea in general in Europe and, and, and what that means. So we found um, in the literature uh, a, a way of thinking about that context um, which is realism. So uh, Pawson and Tilly um, have developed over a long period this idea of realist research. Um, and what they say, and this is a, this is a very, it is great simplification of what they really say, um, but uh, they say that everything programs do or institutions do uh, is driven by theories. And this is not just, I'm, I'm not doing this because I like doing this, because I think a lot of people quote, um, um, for no reason whatsoever, but um, we academics, we, we tend to think of theory as a testable uh, presupposition. It, 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 it is something that we do in science and we have hypotheses that we then can test. And, um, the theories in realism are different beasts. They are not scientific. So realist theories are sets of beliefs about how the world works. And they may be completely nonsensical. They may not be informed by any sense of reality. Uh, they're political. They're assumptions about causal, final and normative relations. So they're obesity, and I will give you an example of this, but obesity, people have assumptions about obesity. That People get fat because they eat wrong, period. That's it. Nah, the evidence shows that that's not true. But still, in the local context, a, a city council may say, we need people to eat more healthy or to exercise more. And that's it, period. Um, so these are assumptions. They're theories about how things work in the world. And causal is cause and effect. Final is the relation between an action and an outcome, and normative things are what you're allowed to do, normatively or not. We can't summarily execute smokers, even though we would like to often, but if, if you smoke, we can't, you can't uh, say you're, 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 you're dead. Well, eventually you will be dead, but um, <laughs> um, you can't say against the wall and there you are, you're punished. Um, the idea about realism, Pawson and Tilly's realism, is that um, those theories can be formulated into a relation between context, mechanism and outcome. So the context is very important to uh, understand the mechanism that is applied to certain ideas about change and that then drives the outcome. Um, this morning I, I explained this to someone as, as a, a particular form in social science of Bayesian statistics. Does anyone know what Bayesian statistics is? 
So Bayesian statistics assumes that there are already a priori distributions of probability. So it doesn't, there, there is no level playing field. That's what Bayesian statistics says. Uh, and that's what we recognize in this research. We say that uh, there is no level playing field. There is no starting point where everything is equal and then we start building. No, there's always context and there's always different ways of thinking about reality. Um, now, the, the other thing is um, that knowing things in research is, is more than just knowing the facts. It's not, it's not just saying this is the epidemiology. This is how many people get ill because they are exposed to a certain toxin or virus. Um, anyone speak Greek? Nah. Um, so there, there are five ways of knowing and five ways of dealing with those different kinds of knowledge. Episteme, epistemology, you know, pe people often use that word. It's, it's the knowledge about facts. These are the things that we know. Um, and, and this is how we create those facts. And some people in certain traditions of science will say that facts are always socially constructed. They're not just value-free facts. The second way of knowing is techne, skill. How you do things. That, that, that's another way of knowing the world. Um, then there's Sophia, wisdom. How you apply what you know to your actions and what you do at certain points in your life to make your knowledge make a difference. Then there is phronesis, phronesis a political astuteness, to be shrewd, Machiavellian behavior for instance, is all about phronesis. It's about knowing how things work in the world and how you can influence people to do certain things and not other things. And a fifth form of uh, knowing and uh, the application of knowledge is parhesia, um, which um, if you are into Foucault, and well, you all speak French, so you all know Foucault by heart. Uh, Foucault uh, really is driven in much of his work by this idea of, of uh, Parisia, which means speaking bold, boldly, speaking truth to power, not being afraid to speak up, saying this is how I believe it is and you need to take responsibility for your actions if this is how I feel the world works. Um, and it's confrontational. But because you're grounded in those other forms of knowing, you know you're right. Um, now, that is, I, I'm, I'm known for uh, having practiced Parisia a lot um, in the past, but I haven't always been grounded in wisdom. Um, and, you know, that's a bad thing because uh, you, you fail. Um, so. Those five ways of knowing and applying knowledge um, have, have an implication for our perspective on research. Research doesn't necessarily equate with knowledge. And knowledge does not necessarily equate with policy. There's, there's, there's a gap between those things. And even if there is policy, and those of you who are involved in policy, Policy doesn't necessarily equate with change. You can have fantastic policies and nothing will happen. So we need to understand what happens between those things. And just a quick reflection, the mission of Chetra, my research organization, is to co-create intelligence for better health. So we recognize that the dynamics of this game are um, fuzzy and that we need to play with knowledge with our different partners in order to create change in very different and bespoke ways. Um, in the context of, of healthy cities, um, a, a famous urban planner, Sir Winston Churchill, said, we shape our cities and then our, our cities shape us, um, which is a true thing. Um, there are different ways of looking at that truth. Um, Professor Billy Giles Corti, uh, one of my colleagues in, in Australia, she does a lot of research around in the area of livability. 
Um, and what Billy says is what, me what gets measured gets done. So as long as you measure stuff and you put it in front of politicians, they will take action. I am not convinced. I think Billy uh, is incredibly naive in this. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, another quote that I think is much more insightful by John Maynard Keynes, The Economist. There's nothing a government hates more than to be well informed, for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. <laughs> and, I, and I think that is very true. You know, governments want to have simplicity. They want to avoid knowledge. This is how it is and this is how we're going to do things. To have knowledge about complexity um, creates trouble because you, you, you have to engage in much more complicated political processes. You have to figure out what happens. So, um, paraphrasing uh, that famous urban planner, Winston Churchill, we, I would say we shape our knowledge and then our log logic shapes us. Um, so, for instance, we could say there is an epidemic of preventable disease. Um, obesity. We know that obesity is not a natural phenomenon. We know that it can, can be avoided. Um, so a lot of governments, local, national, around the world, say, well, that's, that's a complex thing and there's no easy solution. We will not do anything. You know, who? yeah, obesity. <gasps> it's, it's complicated. Um, they could also say, well, this is a complex thing, but we must find an easy solution. And then the response to that is that people would say, uh, well, so some, may, some people make the wrong lifestyle choices. They eat wrong and they don't exercise. So that's an assumption about the world and, and, and this particular thing. So those, need, those people need to stop doing that unwise thing. And that means that we need to start telling them. So, I, 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 before I came to Australia uh, 30 years ago, I, I worked in Denmark and I worked with uh, a, a community activist, by the way, who um, said, this is so bad, this is so bad. And he, he had this fantastic thing that you may want to adopt here too. He said, fingers are important things in the process of motipulation, he came up with. Manipulation and motivation. So, motipulation, that's, that's what he... Um, he said, we don't do this. <laughs> we don't do this. We only do this. And I thought, yes, you know, that is so clear. That is what we want to do. Uh, motipulation, remember that. Um, there's, there's a, a, a third way of, uh, of looking, looking at this, where you say, well, this is a complex thing, so we need to understand it better. We need to understand how to intervene in that complexity. So wise people would say, ah, this has to do with the social determinants of health. Um, I would say, and it has equity dimensions. If you know about social determinants of health, it has equity dimensions. Um, and then you would say, well, systems level institutional re responses are required. Who difficult, but we need to commit to that. Um, and that means that you need to engage in health in all policy development, in governance, in the shared decision making, and all that sort of stuff. Which means that a, a much longer term, much more strategic vision on what is required um, needs to be developed and needs to be applied. And in many countries, uh, electoral cycles, for instance, are just too short to do that well. In Australia, there's elections every three years. So by the time governments get their act together, they're already thrown out of office. There needs to be a new electoral cycle. And I, I think three years is not enough to, to create the context to make those wise decisions. So how do you do that? How do you transcend those political cycles? And I think Community engagement is one of the secrets that we need to recognize as how to do this. So, very quickly, the obesity foresight map. Have you heard of that? It, it, it's, it's the British government saying, oh, we need to understand obesity better. We need to, we need to think about it in, in, in better ways. 
Uh, my colleague Timur Burekin from the competition in, Austra in, in, in Sydney, the Sydney University, uh, he took the obesity foresight map and he turned it into a three-dimensional interactive thing that you can play with. Now, I'm, I'm not showing you the thing, I, I made an animation of this just to show you how complex the relations between all the factors in uh, the obesity network are. And what you will see is that never one of those elements, evidence-based elements, is connected to just one other element. And what it means is that addressing just one element is complete nonsense because you will not fix the complexity. You need to have a systems view. You need to be aware and then address the connections between the elements rather than just one element or a little group of elements. The connection is much more important. So, what we did in Healthy Cities in Europe is um, uh, synthesize what we already know in a realist framework where you would say context is important uh, and we recognize that uh, there's all these dynamics. Um, and we took um, um, uh, inspiration from a project called Decipher, developing uh, an evidence-based approach to city public health planning and investment in Europe, um, which was developed at the University of Sheffield. And they said, look, a lot of the research, a lot of the evidence that we know to address healthy cities and their dynamics already exists. We don't need to research what, what causes obesity. We don't need to research the systems level at which you need to intervene. That is already known. What we want to know is what that means for the actual application in healthy cities, in particular unique healthy cities. Um, so Decipher uh, says, well, between process of decision making in different sectors, there is a number of pathways or mechanisms, which is that Pawson and Tilly realist approach. Um, and they have relations with each other that lead to particular health outcomes. Now, what you can do in each of those relations is establish what evidence there already is on the statistical association between different areas. You can say through observation whether people take action on the, those existing relations. So, you know, physical exercise is healthy. We don't need to in, reinvent that wheel. You just need to observe whether people actually do that. <clears throat> and then there are biomedical pathways. There are certain things that happen to people's bodies in certain contexts, and you can research that. But what you see here is that a lot of those associations are already there, and you just plug in the existing evidence into your framework of understanding how things work in each particular healthy city. Um, I need to move toward the end so that we will have some time for, for questions. Um, two things, data collection. I already mentioned the different sources of, uh, of our information, so annual reporting templates, that questionnaire, those structured case studies, and we trained people in cities at those conferences for a day to make them understand what kind of stories we wanted to hear. We couldn't interview them, we couldn't observe, but we could train them so that they would do what we wanted and to be responsive to the local dynamics in their cities. We did the data mining and we did uh, designation files and document analysis. Then we, 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 we processed all of that data um, and we had uh, uh, masses and masses and masses of information. This was the research team and these were the data. <laughs> Uh, a bit of a mess. Uh, and the thing was, the research team was 15 people. You see here all, all the authors and all the collaborators. And no one was paid by the World Health Organization. We all did this voluntarily. We, we, because of that, that long-standing commitment to healthy cities, we all thought it was a good thing to be associated with it. And we all negotiated with our employers that we would be given the time to, to do this. Um, the only thing that we expected in return was to be invited to meetings, to be able to travel and to stay in a hotel. Um, 
And, and, and then we would have a lot of fun just talking to each other. That was our reward. Uh, and ultimately, yes, we wrote books and articles and all of that uh, out of it. Um, so the data processing, which is uh, sort of my final point here, all of that complexity, all of those dynamics, uh, all of those different uh, uh, sources of, of information, how did we deal with that? Um, so, first of all, we negotiated. We, we took a long time, it took about a year and a half to negotiate. First of all, I negotiated with all the cities and I said, what do you want? What is it that you want to get out of this? Then I negotiated with the World Health Organization. So I knew what they wanted. WHO sponsors this, WHO runs the healthy city. So I needed to sell it to WHO as a valuable and important worthwhile investment. So I then started talking to WHO and I com compiled uh, that, that network of researchers and the real legwork was done by interns, students who think, oh, this is interesting, can I spend half a year in Copenhagen? Yes, yeah, sure, you can spend half a year in Copenhagen. Um, but it was all about negotiating priorities and where do we want to go with this which is about the values of each individual healthy city, WHO priorities, local politics, but also, as I said, the beliefs about the system. What does the system do for you? How do we think it works? Then, um, once we were pretty sure how things uh, uh, worked, we established a data group, which was a core group out of that bigger group that said, we are going to look at all of those data and we are going to turn the data into a source that is informing us uh, how, how we will do our research, um, which was qualitative research, quantitative research. We had some resource experts, so people from Eurostat who knew the data quite uh, intricately, um, and we needed to have mechanisms for validation, uh, triangulation, where you say, well, this seems to be true. Are there other sources of evidence that validate what we think we are seeing in these things. So each of the themes that we had negotiated with cities, because in total there were about 120 different priority areas in the designation, and we negotiated with these healthy cities the broad themes that they thought were important. For instance, equity. They are struggling with equity. They want to know more about what happens around the equity field in different European cities. The other thing, uh, uh, healthy, uh, healthy aging and urban design, that was a, a core thing of, of concern. But also, how do we deal with determinants of health? It is so easy to do this and to deal and, and to make tobacco uh, consumption regulations, very um, sort of proximal interventions close to the cause of, uh, of, of, of bad things, but you, you want to think upstream. So cities wanted to know how do we deal with upstream policy making? So for each of those themes we established a mother report. So we, we just put all the data that we had and a, and, a, and a narrative, an interpretation of that data into often 600 page documents. And the total data volume was uh, over six terabytes of numbers. Um, then, oops, there we go. Um, then what we did was that each group that was established around the theme formulated questions. What do we want to know based on all of that negotiation, based on the context, based on knowing the diversity of those healthy cities? What are the questions that we want to see answered? And then they talked to the data group and they, they said, uh, of the process data, can you interrogate those data, the numbers, the stories, the case studies, everything, and see what comes out of it? And we, we used Envivo to, co to code the qualitative data, so we could do very quick searches in our Envivo databases. Um, and we asked questions, we formulated hypotheses, and then we addressed uh, cross-theme issues. So equity and healthy aging, how does that relate to each other? Um, and then what we did, we wrote papers. Um, but we didn't write papers for publication, or we didn't write papers for chapters in books, we wrote papers for cities. 
because the cities ask these questions and we negotiated this with the cities. The cities are the owners of their own data. They're the owners of their own fate. So we wrote the papers for the cities and we discussed those papers with the cities at one of those next meetings. And out of that came journal articles and, and, and in those journal articles we really claimed and we wrote that uh, that we can be held accountable for what we did, uh, which in our view is what uh, realism and, and realist synthesis is all about. But, and that's maybe what we need to spend uh, some time discussing, uh, if you do all of this, obviously it's, it's incredibly resource intense. And in this particular example, we were given the freedom and liberty by our employers to do this. And WHO supported us and we really felt supported by those 99 healthy cities. We felt that we're do we were doing something of significance. But I can imagine if you're in a university and you need to get a grant that this story is not an easy story for the Canadian Institutes for Health Research to, to fund. Now it's, it's complex, it's a difficult story. You, it took you a year and a half to negotiate with cities what you were going to evaluate? Get off it, you know, I want to do it now. Uh, so um, that's a discussion that needs to be had. How would this perspective, which everybody says, particularly at the coal phase in cities, is relevant, how would that enter the discourse of the research funders? And with that, I, I'm ending my monologue and now we're going to have a dialogue, I hope. <laughs>